This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, August 17th, 2023. Um, it is good to see everybody. Let me turn on the transcript. There we go. And I think we're due for a check-in call. So I thought we would just sort of do that and see where that takes us. Uh, I think a couple more people will probably show up, but I'm happy to, to sort of go into it. And I think maybe a falling back on my original check-in format will work because last time waiting for people to check in was funny. It, was, uh, it wasn't working like it normally did. So I think I'll, I'll just go around the room and uh, see what people are up to. And then we can go from there. Uh, so how about we start with Doug, then Doug. So Doug B, then Doug C, just to sort out the Dougs. Sure. Um, so um, for me, this has been, uh, the last few weeks have been the first time in my adult life I feel like I actually took a vacation from uh, thinking in a directed, intentional way. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Um, so I'm not sure why it took, it eluded me for this long, um, but it's sort of ni nice to meet vacation that way. <laughs> um, and I'm gearing up for next week when my full load kicks back in and um i'm sort of noticing a lot of changes in the way i'm seeing and relating to that um and i'm also notwithstanding my um desire to not have it exert pull uh undo pull and diversion from what I'm looking to really devote attention to. Um, I'm really feeling the incoming of uh, global change and meltdown and collapse. Um, every other day, at least, um, I'm smelling Canada out my door. Um, and uh, um, and Hawaii and the parade. And Ken, you're, you posted a video of a French fellow with a few graphs um, that basically said, you know, we're, we're already past that, that peak of the roller coaster. We're headed south quick. Um, and it's not defined, but um, it's sort of, de facto and uh, coming and uh, this great void and unknown of how fast and how bad and at what scale uh, and in how many places at the same time. So I'm, I'm really sort of feeling the pressure of that more than I have in, in, in a while. Um, and I don't know whether that's opening up viscerally to vibrationally the reality of it, um, as a human being, as a sensor, um, or whether it's uh, just an escalation of incoming. And with that, I'm complete. Doug, thank you. And um, how did vacation feel? Like what, what, what was going on for you inside? And if I can follow on, you said that your approach to next week is now different, but you didn't yeah. tell us how it's different. You just muted yourself. The 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 switch um, that sort of was thrown um, really involved uh, the me as an actor, as a protagonist, as a source, as a um, driver, diminishing to zero, and it being much more about um, energetically being in service and in inquiry. So I'm looking at a calendar landscape and a list of, you know, to-dos and engagements, collaborations and work um, that 
involved me with that center of focus, sort of that kind of egocentricity at the heart of doings. And so if you take that out, then how do I, how do I adapt and modify my, the way, the change in the way I'm seeing and relating to all of that? <laughs> um, with me being a lot less of a driver and a lot more of a, a existing within, if that makes sense. Um, and, and it's also completely contra the, the prevailing cultural order in terms of the way most people relate to work and doing and, and all of that stuff. And I, you know, for the last six years, I checked out of the transaction frame completely. I, I disconnected my service, my work from meeting my needs. Um, and I've never imposed that on any collaborators or within any projects I'm involved with. But out of the blue, my partner, who's been on vacation in 2B Elemental, came back and she was like, I've, I've really come to a decision that I want us to do that with 2B Elemental, like to offer our services and not uh, have it uh, set up in a transactional frame of money for. And I was like, well, I can buy that inside. I'm like jumping up and down and going, yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it, it's challenging because you really have to figure out how to terraform and change the way you relate to the inflow side of the equation in meeting needs when it's, when meeting needs is disconnected from um, and so that's sort of an exciting place to have company in, in terms of feeling into that and figuring out new ways of relating to that and doing that. So, yeah, those are the changes. Thanks, Doug. And I think you weren't here last week because you were on vacation. And last week we went into sort of a conversation about collapse and decided that next week, we're going to kind of come back into a conversation having read a little bit more deeply and, and taken a bite out of different apples, both about collapse and about reconstruction and revitalization. So Pete put up a, a Google Doc with a bunch of documents. I think that Ken added a bunch of documents to that document. I mean, a bunch of books to the document. And I expect and, you to read them all before next week. <laughs> and exactly. And, and a piece of what we're trying to do is divide and conquer so that we don't all have to read them all by next week. Exactly. Uh, um, where are those references posted? I will post a link to the Google Doc in the chat momentarily. Uh, in the meantime, you're next in the queue to check in. So if, uh, the, the queue would be Doug C. Hank Gill. Well, to me, climate change is ominous and invisible. And that's a difficult thing to live with. We see the footprints of like a gigantic elephant stalking the earth, uh, Maui being an example of one of the footsteps of climate change. Uh, I am uh, impressed, I can't think of a better word, by how many people are not talking about how this climate thing might end. Uh, where does it take us to? Uh, I just don't hear very much of that conversation. Uh, we're going to die, but how? Why don't we talk about that? End of check-in. Thanks, Doug. I just pasted the, um, the Google Doc in the chat. Uh, Hank Gill Klaus. In uh, thinking about uh, today's check-in, I made a list of seven different things which were top of my attention. Uh, so that's too many for a check-in. So let me uh, do one of the most recent things. About uh, two and a half hours ago, I came back from the first session of a course which I'm taking. Uh, at the university, and the course uh, is called Learning Through Our Body, and it has to do with knowing by using our senses, especially a sense of hearing, a sense of tasting, sense of smell, 
And uh, today was the introduction, and it was also the introduction to uh, uh, hearing. Uh, how do we hear things? Uh, what do we hear? What don't we hear? Do we jump to interpretation as soon as we hear something? Or do we, as Susan Sontag uh, wrote back in the 60s, uh, postpone evaluation and really uh, listen? to what you hear. Uh, can you hear history? Can you hear art? Uh, there's a, another course which I'm going to investigate called Auditory Cultures, uh, as I think many of the people on this call might agree with. Uh, originally, Western uh, countries, uh, Western, Western cultures, uh, were in what Walter Ong used to call uh, orality. And then to use uh, the myth of Plato with the, uh, with the invention of uh, the written word, we moved uh, away from orality into uh, being what you might even call uh, colonized or victimized by our eyes, where for most people, most of the information we take in comes through seeing. So we did a number of interesting experiments uh, uh, inside the, uh, the classroom, which was in a church. Uh, we closed our eyes for 30 seconds and listened. And what did we hear in the room and what did we hear outside in the city? And another exercise, we moved out onto the roof where we could see the city, but then closed our eyes and listened for a minute to hear all the kinds of things which, when we jump to judgment or jump to interpretation, we don't normally hear the sounds of the city and how even on a, implicitly they can become your comfort zone. And when you come back to a place, you love the sounds of the traffic or the sirens or the silence or the wind in the trees, whatever your comfort zone might be. Uh, so I was, uh, was fascinated by learning something that I had always taken for granted before. So I thought I'd just share that with you. Thank you, Hank. And uh, it's really interesting how when you tune into your senses, you just pick up a whole bunch of different things and how automatic we are about our senses so often, including eating. I find that if I don't read email while eating, I have a very different experience eating. I actually remember I ate and taste the food and feel the texture and all of that. It all kind of shows up. Um, Ken. Uh, many years ago, I was at a meditation retreat with Thich Nhat Hanh, and so there's like 50 of us there, and um, they bring out a bowl of oranges, and everybody goes over and grabs an orange, and we spend 20 minutes looking at this orange, smelling it, sniffing it, and just, you know, examining it. And we, then we go and put them back in the bowl, and they and they mix them all up, and then you have to go up and find your orange, and every single person found their orange. What? It was... Every orange is unique. When you spend 15, 20 minutes looking at orange, you go, I know that orange, that's my orange. And I, 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 it was really amazing. Just one of those things of when you really open your senses and examine something, you form a relationship with it. And, and it's just, it blew my mind. It's like, how does this happen? But I'd throw uh, that in. Were, were uh, you told ahead of time you'd have that challenge? Or? No, I just said, grab an orange. And we're going to do an orange meditation. And then after we... We did this, put it back, and now you have, and they mix it all, and they have to go find orange, and then you had to sit there and eat it mindfully, like one, you know, peel it and and put one segment in your mouth and chew it thoroughly and wait until it's fully dissolved before you swallow. I mean, it was it took like ninety minutes to do this whole meditation. It's really amazing, but okay, give me they a did very not tell you that you would have to retrieve your orange. They did not. They did okay. not. You were not trying to memorize your orange to find it again. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah it was just You're just forming a bond with it like a pet exactly you know it's it's well, orange they, theory. they told you in advance it would be a completely different experience yeah, yeah. i just wanted to make sure i understood the extra yeah. yeah exactly thanks ken that's really cool yeah um our cue is gil klaus mike 
Yeah, I'm, I am just so enriched and fed already by what you all have said so far. So thank you for that, each of you. Um, um, I was thinking of Thich Nhat Hanh also, and just the reminder that it's, it's so different to do one thing at a time than what we normally do of many things at a time. And so en enough said on that. Um, um, Hank, I've been, I guess I've been learning what you're talking about and also sort of re resetting my attitudes about it to, from the notion that my mind is in my brain, to the notion that my mind is in my body, to the notion that mind is in all of us together in the conversations, interactions that we are, the boundaries are blurred. And I like that. I'm enriched by the blurring of the boundaries and the expansion of the sense of who I am and who we are in this story, um, which maybe has something to do, Doug, with what you're saying. I am. I am also in as 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 several of you have said, um, um, in the grip of this um, wild roller coaster ride that we're in. Um, um, what was the metaphor? Um, you know, you, you know something is happening here, but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? Well, Mr. Jones here does know, but uh, the song reference. So, um, um, it's really disorienting to recognize that we have no ability to predict what's coming at us. I mean, we have the general shape of it, uh, but we don't know the details. And we don't know the timing. Um, and, um, you know, whether that's climate change or American politics or any of the number of crises that we're facing, um, it's all up for grabs. And so part of my practice is to, uh, is, is to learn how to be relatively calm and focused and deliberate and, um, and loving in the midst of the chaos. Um, I'm, I, I confess I've been one of the uh, geezers who has had the attitude of, well, I'm, I, you know, it, it sort of, I, I'm, I'm relieved that I won't see the worst of it. You know, others will, um, but I, I can't, I can't rest in that because I'm not, you know, I'm, uh, um, both my sense of connectedness and responsibility to the people I love and to the younger people I love and future generations. And also the realization that, yeah, it's really actually going to bite us because it's moving very fast. Um, um, so learning how to dance with massive uncertainty uh, and, and giving up the addiction to prediction um, that so many of us have, so many, so many of us have um, you know, you turn on the telly and it's filled with people saying exactly what's going on and what's going to happen next. Nobody fucking knows. So um, I'm finding I'm finding some comfort in releasing the prediction addiction and just looking at what's the next thing to do. Uh, that's the best thing that I can do. Um, and with that in mind, the other part of the check in is I've talked uh I've talked with you all before about critical path capital, the private equity play that I've been building um, to acquire um, climate relevant um, small and medium sized businesses from aging and retiring owners <clears throat> and not just um, not just improve their operations and focus and strategic relevance and uh, um, collaborative coordination within them, but to put them in the hands of their employees as employee owned uh, and effective companies. And this is uh, this is a project that has really had a grip on me for about 11 or 12 years. Uh, and I've kept on picking it up, looking at the orange can, examining the orange, figuring out strategies, plans, building collaborations, making moves, then putting it down, thinking it's just like, I can't do this for various reasons. Um, uh, you know, short-term economics, my wife's health issues, the, the Palo Alto gig, um, uh, my 
energy as an older guy, the, the time horizon of a launch and whether I can make a five or 10 year commitment to something responsibly. Um, and uh, I keep on putting it down because of you know practical assessments and it keeps on coming and picking me up like a like a big eagle grabbing me by its talons and saying, no, we're claw. We're, we're going for a ride, guy. We are going for a ride. Um, and in the last uh, last several days, I've been contacted by, was it three? I think three other companies doing adjacent moves, doing trying to do similar things in this room, not exactly the same as what we're doing. So maybe competitive, but actually maybe very complementary in a very powerful way. Um, and um, we just had a bid yesterday from a contracting company from some work on our house. And their business model was not what I'm talking about, but stunning in its creativity and its adjacency. So I'm, 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 I'm back. I'm back in the saddle or back in the claws of the eagle trying to figure out how to make this damn thing work because there's something here that I think is really powerful and contributory uh, to the challenges ahead and um, trying to figure out how to do it. Um, Kevin Jones, I want to come back and talk with you again in probably a couple of weeks. I need to, I got some digesting of this slowly eating orange to do, um, but we've, we've got stuff to talk about and Doug very much want to talk with you uh, sooner than that, like in the next day or two, if if your calendar will permit. Um, and um, yeah, Doug Carmichael, the uh, the footprints of the elephant. That was a very powerful mm. image for me. Are you, are you still here? Mm. Yeah, there you are. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> you know, something happening, we can't quite see it. Um, on, on the notion of nobody's talking about it, though, I just want to say two things. One is that uh, Ken and I, in hosting the Living Between Worlds call yesterday, started with that question about, like, you know, everybody says that nobody's talking about. We had a very rich um, and provocative and personal strate and strategic conversation about that. It's really rewarding for us and other participants. The video, we'll have the video posted within the week and I'll share that with you guys when it's posted. But the other thing on nobody's talking about it is I've got a client who's working in the oil and gas industry in Houston, um, actually chose to embed themselves there. Um, um, and they report uh, that they are hearing different conversations from their colleagues in the oil and gas industry. And it's not where we would like it to be, but it's like a, it's like a perplexed dismay hmm. acknowledgement of, holy crap, look at those footprints. What, what might those be? Like these were people who were saying like six months ago, there ain't no footprints. Shut up about your footprints. And now they're like, they're unsettled. Uh, and, um, I just take that as a very interesting marker in this conversation about nobody's talking about it. They're not talking about it the way we'd like them to talk about it, but man, they are no longer escaping it. They, whoever, some number of they. So, um, and and that's, sorry to go on so long, but let me just say, um, We're in, in, in addition to all the physical and economic markers, we're moving into a very strange psychological time in the world where people will be navigating their disarray and unfamiliarity and uncertainty in strange ways. And I'll, the last thing I'll say is this, is that in that list, Ken, I'm sorry to steal your thunder here, but you'll, I'll, be, I'll beg your forgiveness later. Uh, in this list of books about collapse, um, uh, Ken found a book about the regeneration of collapsing civilizations. And I think we need to read both of these literatures. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot about how things fall apart. Um, what do we do in the face of that? Um, there's another, another, the age of unmooring is another place to investigate. So thank you. Well, thank you for what you've shared and for letting me roll so long. I'm, I'm done. Thanks, Gil. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, at the very beginning, you talked about multitasking, and I just wanted to, I've said this, I think, on one or two OGM calls before, but I 
I don't like the trope that humans are terrible at multitasking. If you just look at a jazz ensemble, they are deeply multitasking at many different levels. Humans are really pretty good. Uh, our friend S.D. Solomon Gray uh, had a chunk of her career about multi-minding. And she says, just look at a mom and what a mom does, what a mom with a job does all day long. She's busy multitasking like crazy, very efficiently. So I prefer to think of it as a, as a polarity to manage. Uh, and I would, and uh, long ago, I proposed that there be interfaces that take us from single task, deep focus, blanket everything, cover everything else away, over to, I'm going to enter Bruce Lee territory and multitask right now, and I'm going to get rid of my big queue of emails that I haven't been able to touch and this whole set of articles that I need to forward to the right people and whatever. And I'm going to make, I'm going to elect to be in one mode or the other, and that it's okay and the, the problem with demonizing multitasking and telling us that humans are terrible at it is that it makes people not go in and do that. It's like, ooh, this is taboo territory. It's like, why? Because if we could be very efficient about it, you can get through a whole bunch of stuff to clear up more time for yourself to actually go and single task on purpose intentionally and clear the decks. Anyway, I spoke about that longer now than I, I meant to. What was the phrase you used, Jerry? Instead of multitasking, you mentioned a mom who was a multi- Multi-minding, which is Multi SD, That's SD, much deeper. Yeah, SD Solomon Gray, and I'll put a link to some of her work in the chat. Um, you know, Brian, Brian Franklin used to say that the most powerful person in any, any room is the person who's the most emotionally versatile. And the analog with you is that, you know, humans who are versatile in the modes we can play in, adaptable, appropriate to the situation is really good. Um, on the jazz musician, though? Yeah. They're not multitasking. They're doing one thing. They're playing. But they're, they're doing one multi-layered thing. They're paying, a, they're, paying, thing. they're paying attention to a multitude of things simultaneously. Yeah, I don't know. It's one task. They're, they're making jazz beautiful music with other people. But they're, they're, the layers that they're, mi that they're minding are like boggling sometimes. Yeah. They're multi-threading. Yeah, and well, Jerry, you know this from being on the mat in the dojo. You're actually not paying attention to lots of different things. Something else is going on. That I, well, I, I don't know the way to describe it, but it's not. Right. Yeah. You mean something's happening here, but you don't know what it is. <laughs> I think we should. I think we should. I think we should conduct the rest of this conversation just by quoting songs, but, specifically but, Bob Dylan. Yeah, but I want to say. But I want to say. Can, 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 can we twice, return right. to the check-in? Yeah. yeah. Is anybody familiar with the 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 phenomenon of synesthesia? Yes. Which is a person who all their emotions, all the senses are are one. And that I think is what happens in great jazz, that there is no thinking, there is no, uh, and, and, and everything is just coming in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Stuart. Ken, briefly, and then we'll go back to the queue. Two things. One, uh, a distinction I heard that I really liked was humans can multitask. We can listen to the radio and drive or listen to the news while we're washing the dishes, but we can't multifocus, which is why we can't drive and text at the same time because there are two very different frames of mind. There's tasking and focusing. And if you're trying to focus on texting while you're driving 70 miles an hour, you're probably going to run off the road and kill yourself or someone else. So I like that distinction. Uh, the second one is um, I went to hear Wynton Marsalis uh, talk about his book, Great sweet sweet swing blues on the road and he he said jazz is the most democratic art form because the person who with with the biggest ears the person who can listen the most is the person who brings things together and so what they're doing is they're listening to what are the people doing and responding in the moment to to their listening which brings us to a whole different ontological level of uh, the listening of jazz is a very interesting ontology anyway that's my my comment thank you really appreciate that uh, our cue is Klaus Mike Ken. Yeah, it's actually a great metaphor, Jazz, <clears throat> because it is, in my mind, multitasking, because you really have to pay attention to so many things, but it's aligned, right? Everybody wants to play jazz. You don't have one guy who wants to play tango. Uh, you know, they're, they're all they're all in the same in the same rhythm. Uh, and then it works. Uh, so, but it, had, it requires a certain level of alignment. I, I'm always coming back to don't look up, right? I mean, from the the uh, 
so so much of what seems to to unfold around us right now is really reflected in that movie. I don't think it's all that difficult to to do a trend analysis and to to have a broad understanding of what we're heading towards. I mean, right now the uh, um, you have both India and China uh, flooding because the glaciers, the Himalayan glaciers, are melting so fast, you know, that the rivers can't uh, can handle this. And if you go online and just take a look at how devastating this is, where you have flooding, catastrophic levels of flooding, and the pictures that you see are cars floating down the river and houses getting uh, unmoored and so on. What you don't see are the millions of acres of farmland that are getting flooded and wiping out entire crops. So China and India already have lost major uh, uh, parts of their crop. Here in the United States, our winter crop is at the level of 1956. We have the worst winter crop you know, since 1956. And so the, the, it's, it's quite uh, foreseeable that uh, um, if, we, if we don't change you know, our, our way of living in this changing environment, then we'll, we'll uh, invite you know, some really bad times. There was an article that came out yesterday um, how farm, how crop insurance in the farm bill is paying farmers in Arizona to put crops down that don't belong into Arizona. You know, they, they, it's too hot, it's too arid and so on. But then crop insurance compensates them for whatever losses they incur, so they keep doing it. And somehow the, the uh, governance of crop insurance doesn't anticipate changes and can't deal with changes. You know? so, so you can pretty much foresee food shortages you know, that, are, that are going to be increasingly catastrophic. Uh, we are going to continue to be shielded from it in North America and in, and in Europe because we have more money and we just keep buying food from countries that shouldn't really export their food because they don't have enough of it. But you know, there is this, uh, this commerce uh, uh, that, that takes place. So we you know, keep buying from South America and Indonesia you know, and, and, and countries uh, in Africa, so we keep buying food you know, and, and supply ourselves. But this is this is such a. I think that the, the core issue really is that we don't clock exponential change. Uh, it's just, uh, and, and I must. It's, it's happened to me because I've been, I've been working with the Sierra Club for six years, going on seven years, and so I've been really engaged in in this uh, field since my retirement, really ten years ago, and. Five years ago, you felt out of line saying, you know, by 2030, this could be really bad. I mean, there was like no indication that 20, uh, 22, 23, 24 could be seeing significant impacts. But now here it is, and it's really accelerating. You know? uh, and and there, there are so many risk factors out there. You know, I mean, the Tantra is melting, releasing methane. Uh, there's more methane underneath the Tantra than there is in the atmosphere, total greenhouse gases. Right? I mean, so the, the, the uh, amount of, 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 of risk you know, and, and the mitigation window is really closing. You know? I mean, there's, there's only so much you can do. We were talking about when Trump came in, that you know, when you figure there's a train going down the, the, the track, you know, they were they were throwing switches that made this train go into into the or maintain the same direction where you wanted to throw switches to turn that train, which had happened you know, under the Obama administration, but then it got all wiped out again. And so now we have, we have, we have, we are you know, under the Biden administration. They're trying to reset this change in direction, but we just lost. The most precious years to really um, to really get into this and make an impact. So, but in in still in all of this, you, know, you have 
um, you have a political system and a financial system that absolutely you know, refuses to uh, to deal with this. Um, and and I don't know how um, I don't know what it takes because when you look around I mean, in in Hawaii, right? We're talking about the devastation in Hawaii, but you don't have a camera ever put on the agricultural fields that got wiped out. Now, it's a major agricultural production center there. And they were doing seeds mostly and so on. So the, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, uh, the impact of all this, and, and you try to be positive, Gil, I totally understand. You know, you, you, you're trying to focus on what can I do next? But I think it is also important to step back and understand the, the most likely direction this is taking, right? I mean, put statistical averages on trend lines and, 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 and then mix it and see where is this most likely going to go, leave room for variations, right? And when you do that, when you see these trend lines going, unfolding in front of you, um, you no, know, it's it's like this proverbial asteroid coming our way. You know, it it is uh, um, it is really not complicated. You know, I, as I watched uh, Elon Musk uh, the other day giving a twelve minute uh, uh, perspective on climate change, and he started out by saying it's really not complicated, and it isn't. Right? I mean, we are making it complicated. It's not complicated. It's a, these are very basic physics you know, that, are, uh, that, that we have set in motion. So having said all that, it's nice to see that of all the groups I'm working with, the Sierra Club is ramping up and, and people are getting really excited and focused uh, because uh, I think that's probably the group that's closest you know, to, to nature and to, uh, to working you know, with the environment and, and with uh, the base of pyramid economy and uh so it's good to see that you now they're they're really uh getting active and, and excited but then when you look at what's happening in washington you know the the defenses are ramping up you know it's not like you know you you, you make an impact explaining that uh, he, he, here's what's happening and here's where we should go no i mean they're digging in you know, to perpetuate systems that are clearly uh, harmful. So, so no, I'm, I just uh, you know, try to stay um, in the middle. I, I feel like Doug, right? I mean, uh, uh, Doug, Doug, Michael, the, it, it's, it's an emotional uh, uh, thing that, that, that hits you. You know too much, right? It's, sometimes it's better to just uh, 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 warp yourself off and warded off and what have you but uh um and and then the other thing is that i, I did work in a company where we were operating in 30 countries so i so i have sort of a linkage right i pick up reports i pick up news clips uh, from places that i'm somewhat familiar with and and uh and then you see the, the collective impact you know i mean you you you, you see these climate impacts in India and China and Pakistan, you know, in, in Africa and Sudan, Yemen and so on. And, and it's, it's marching forward, right? I mean, it's, it's global. And so you can talk about the collapse of civilizations, that's all good. But, you know, those were, those were uh, uh, localized events that we, that we historically experienced. This is not localized anymore. You know, this is global. There's no place where too bad we screwed up uh, in, uh, this part of the world, but let's go someplace else. There's no place else to go to. So anyway, I'm sorry. I mean, I just need to be up and positive and all this stuff. And, <laughs> and uh, but uh, uh, yeah, no, I think we're in for a rough ride. And I don't know who, oh, like Gil, you were thinking that uh, maybe that's for the next generation. I don't think so. I don't think we're going to make another 10 years uh, you know, uh, uh, living in, in, a, in a civilization and in a technical environment as we are used to right now. I, don't, I think this is going to run so much faster 
then we then we then we can process or accept emotionally. On our call in 2033, we can compare notes and see how it went. Man. Um the queue is Mike Ken Carl. Uh, thanks. Uh, really interesting insights today, although I, I, I hear the same theme and it's been running through my head as well about collapse and and, and unpredictable change. Uh, like Hank, I have at least seven items on my list and uh, I'm going to do it in, in, in Twitter form. Uh, the first really exciting news is that on Wednesday, my daughter starts a master's of public health program at uh, George Washington University. Looking cool. at, at the impact of environment on human health. Oh my health. God, girl Lizzie, uh, can and she just, come do a presentation for us at some point? Just what what she's interested in and where she's headed. I, I think she could do several presentations, and she should, which certainly help the gender balance in this. Uh, I uh, agree entirely. We've got here. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, that's exciting, and she's part of the Millican School, which has tons of money, and so she's not going to uh, go too deeply in debt. Speaking of debt, uh, Kathleen and I are signing the papers on our new house in an hour and a half. Whoa. Uh, but uh, that's kind of fun, just moving two miles and in the process, having to try to purge some of the garbage that I have so we don't carry it all with me into the new house, which is, of course, impossible. Um if anybody is, has any good uh, meditations on throwing things or I mean, I, Judy I, has something to offer you. I have something to offer. I, I don't know if they have them in your area, but I use an organizing company, which actually comes in, packs and sorts and does whatever you want it to do and gets it ready to go. And they just took away uh, bookcases and chairs and lamps and other things, and they get them to the right donor and get me a receipt. So you might look up professional organizers in your area. The yeah, I've actually, I hired one who was working at my church. The problem is not the big stuff, the bookcases and things like that. No, it's, it's the little it's stuff. The paper. It's, it's the paper. And sometimes it's a single piece of paper from 32 years ago. <laughs> not only has great personal meaning, it has great historical meaning. You know, it was well, a draft but, of a speech I wrote for Al Gore that kind of pushed the UN in a new direction. You know, it's, yeah, okay. I'm the I only get, one who has it. <laughs> I, get, I get that. Um, I have a different process for doing those, but what they've done to help me is they put it all in order by date and they selectively pull out what they think might be important so I can go through the rest separately. So yeah. again, it just, it saved me tons of time because they were packing up. I had... I think nine boxes of books coming out of these glass fronted bookcases that I was getting rid of that were sitting in the furnace area because I had so many other bookcases already full in the house. So just a thought. Well, that, that's a good thought. I, I think the other thing I need is a robot that will just come in and digitize my entire life. Oh yeah, there's including that. Including all my books and violate all the copyright. I, I, that's what I need. Well, he, he part, of it though is, part of it is that I'm an old timer and it's like, but what if all that goes down? What if the internet goes down and all my books are no longer available to me because I don't have physical copies of them? Now, the ones I got rid of were mostly junk paperbacks. Although as I started going through them, I thought, well, I should pull out women's reality. That was a classic in 1970 on women's issues. And then I thought, if I do this, I'll never get rid of the books. And I haven't looked at women's reality in 20 years. <laughs> you know? yeah. So. I have the same problem, though. I feel I owe it to that book, particularly if it was given to me by the author with a signature, and I and I read one page that had great meaning. You can refresh. Well, you can refresh all of that on women's issues by listening to uh, America Ferrara's monologue in Barbie. Oh, I haven't seen yet. I uh, think we saw, we I, saw it. We saw it last yeah. night. Totally worth seeing. It's yeah. it's, it's funky, yeah. but I think, it's I, think, I think Gil has a two finger intervention here to solve my yeah. problem. <laughs> I, I I can't solve your problem. I'm going to applaud Judy's uh, organizer's plan of putting it, putting the papers in date order so you can go through them quickly. Of course, that doesn't work as well if you haven't dated your notes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, well, I've got but I usually use a lot of times I've printed them and I have stacks of paper that I printed that I thought were important. Those can be sorted because they're printed by date. But it's no, it's it's a it's a perennial issue. Did you, did you print all the ones that say in the bottom of them, don't print this email? <laughs> Probably. 
<laughs> so I've got the same problem. We're purging a lot. We're not moving, but we're trying to do a lot of purging. And 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 one of the bottlenecks is the boxes full of papers. Uh, and if an organizer came in, they would just take them and pitch them. And I know that there's like one page or maybe two in that box that are critically important. And the practice that I'm practicing is to pick a box and set a timer and just blaze through it as fast as I possibly can. And that works. And be only looking for the gem and ignoring everything else. And I will pull the gem and then dump the box. I have been going through many boxes. Stuart, I'll go to you in just a second. I'm going through many boxes to the point where I'm finding acetates. Oh yeah. That I've printed before. <laughs> so I've, I've I've made it back to 1996, which yeah. is apparently the last year that I used acetates before <laughs> going to to other devices. Uh, and here's a presentation for Coopers and Librand, June of '96, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. And some of these things I'm scanning because I don't have the original files anymore, and I just want to remember what I said back when. So I've got I bought a little a little quick uh, snap scan scanner, and that's working really well. Sorry, that was going to be part of my check in, uh, Stuart. And then let's get back to the queue. Yeah. So just two quick things. One, um, I think there's a national service call. Who's got junk? They'll come and pick up anything. Okay. They're expensive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just I just throw it out. The other point is, as we're going through stuff, you know, um, maybe what we wrote 30, 40, 50 years ago was just not that important, <laughs> not worth the time to dig in and just just get rid of stuff. I mean, well, in some cases, it makes you feel really good because you get so <laughs> much of it right. You know, Jerry in particular, right? you can go back and listen to some of the talks he gave at PC Forum 30 years ago. One, just to finish more. my check-in, though, just yeah. to finish the check-in. The, uh, the other quick thing is I am still struggling to get words on paper. I have all I have four talks, four talks that should be four papers, and I've got to get these done. And again, I, I think a cattle prod is the only thing to use at this point. <laughs> <laughs> One of my distractions, though, I posted in the chat on Monday, we're having a really interesting uh, preview of a new book called Digital Empires, mm. which will be out in 10 days. It's by a new Bradford, the author of The Brussels Effect, which is how Brussels has been trying to shape the digital infrastructure of our future. And now she's looking at the US, China, and Europe, and all the ways in which they're trying to constrain, define, redirect uh, uh, what digital technology will do. And just to finish, one of the reasons I haven't been able to get my writing done is I am just immersed in tracking the Trump trials. And it reminds me of what I did when I was 10 watching the, or actually 12 when I was watching the Watergate hearings. And in 87, when I was watching the Iran-Contra escapades as I was finishing my PhD thesis, I mean, this really seems significant and I wanna understand what's going on and, and what, what, uh, what could happen because it's a moment in history. And the last, uh, last thought was um, uh, on my check-in was, I'm not going to give a, a song. I'm going to give a movie. I, I do think Idiocracy is the movie of our time. I, I agree. Don't look up is is great farce, but Idiocracy is way too true. There was a very sad story in today's paper about subway surfing and a boy here in Washington, D.C., who, in order to take a TikTok video, climbed on top of a metro subway and, and you know went riding on it until he fell off and died. Um, just crazy stuff going on. It, it is almost as if TikTok was invented to make us dumber and kill ourselves. <laughs> and to finish on a hopeful thing and to suggest a topic for the future, I think the only thing that will save us is ritual. Mm. In the past, we all went to church. My ritual is making coffee for my wonderful wife before she wakes up every morning. And I'm getting very obsessive about trying to find the best coffee and the best way to make it. Tea might be an even better ritual. That both the Japanese and the British seem to be really big into it. But in a time of total uncertainty and instability, having something you do every day or every week may be the answer, maybe what we need to build on. So maybe that's a topic for a future session. Fair enough. Thanks. Oh, great. Uh, Judy, briefly, and then we'll go to the just, just one quick comment, because all of us are, I'm sure, prodigious readers and have 
books coming out the wazoo in our house. There's an organization I discovered a number of years ago called, called ABE Booksellers. It's American Book Exchange. And they actually list books that are first, first editions have inscriptions from the author, that kind of thing. And that might be an organization to see if you could supply to books because then they get recycled to the right people. Thanks, Judy. Um, our cue is Ken Carl Stewart. Well, speaking of purging, um, I have about a thousand CDs at my house and uh, I don't want to take them <laughs> with me when I leave. So I am sitting here I, for Amazon day. I bought a two terabyte drive that's this big and this thin. And I'm sitting here transferring a thousand CDs for the last two months. I'm about 650 CDs in. I do a few every day and um, getting those in order. Um, it's actually part of a, of a psychological campaign to get myself ready to move out of this place, possibly to Europe. We're looking at going to Italy. And um, it's like, there's this huge psychological hurdle of packing up a house, so much inertia there, all the books and, and records. And I have cassette tapes and CDs and, you know, furniture and like, oh man, I can't even think about it. But this is a tangible step. I've taken this. And now that I'm, I'm, I'm new to this, like now I'm, I have a commitment to once a week, go to the garage, take down a banker's box, look through it, sort it, sift it, toss it, say, keep whatever I need, reduce everything. So it's helping me to, to um, get motivated um, after a long time of pushing this off to the, you know, not till the end, but, but long enough to where it was feeling like there's some pressure. So um, that's my, that's my purge. And then, you know, uh, my wife was really into Marie Kondo for a while. So, you know, we took every single article of clothing out of the closet, laid it on the bed, picked it up, said, does this spark joy? No. Okay. Toss it. Yeah. I like this. I'm going to keep this. So that's, that's something I do is, you know, I, I like talking to my objects, you know, do, so do I want to keep this, this, you know, I've never listened to this. I have this, I have, I'm finding CDs unopened that I'm sitting in my collection. I'm like, where did this come from? Who gave me this? But, since storage is cheap, it's all going on the drive. Um, I, I'm in a better frame than I was a few weeks ago. The, this summer has been very hard. I, I, Doug, I came in in the middle of your share, so I don't know exactly what you were saying, but um, you know, the heat, the fires, all the the crazy stuff has just hit me very hard. Of you know, I've been tracking this for 36 years. 1987 is when I started tracking climate change and stuff, and. Um, not that long, Mike, or my math is off. Or... <laughs> it's the opposite of this. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because I, I, I take I, this as I disagree, but yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I remember working with Joanna Macy in the early 90s. She talked about figure ground reversal. And I think one of the things the Anthropocene is doing is in the Holocene, the environment was in the background. We, it was stable. It was, you know, we could count on things. The Anthropocene, things, we have climate chaos. The, the background of the environment is now the foreground of our lives and, and the agency of Gaia is coming to the fore. We're seeing all kinds of, of effects that, that are way beyond our ability to control and possibly, you know, going to take us to the, our, the edge of our ability to adapt. Um, and so I was in a, I was in a funk, but I can't stay there for very long, you know, um, when the first book I read after my assigned media fast in my coaching course was Irving Ulom's Existential Psychotherapy, which is a big fat tome. And it's a really well-written book. I, I like Ulom's writing. And he says, you know, there are times in life when, when the existential door opens up, a loved one dies and you spend, you're, you're plunged into this chaos. And, and it's a time of incredible discovery, but it's a, place that very few people can sustain being in they you know it's very uncomfortable we want to get out of it and i think what's happening now is is that level of existential angst which has been pushed away and denied for so long is breaking through for a lot of people and it's extremely discomforting like oh man i don't like this at all and um you know i have equally long time 36 years ago i started to meditate and and i've learned with moods as well, not just thoughts, but with moods to say, this is just a passing mood. I don't want to get attached to this. I'm going to observe it. I'm going to, I'm going to feel it and, and notice it's here, but I'm not going to hang on to it or cling to it or, you know, so that practicing of non-attachment 
it's really helpful, especially with with moods of um, terror and fear. Uh, you know, I do my best to cultivate moods that are generative for myself, but there's times when I have to just say, oh man, I'm overwhelmed here. And if I can let that in and go, I'll be in overwhelm until overwhelm moves along, either because I shifted or its own accord, it helps me to, to not get sucked in as much. And so um, after a, about um, four to six weeks of feeling, hey, I'm now back on, okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's really grim and a lot of terrible things are headed our way, but um, I have what I call compassionate determination. I'm, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep doing whatever I can do. I know it's not nearly enough, but it's, it's what I can do and it's what I need to do. So, um, so that's giving me, me, uh, tapping into some, some resilience. I'm reminded of, uh, Camus thing about, you know, in the midst of, of winter, I found within me an invincible summer. Uh, I, I don't have a huge amount of, of, um, bright futures in my mind but i have a huge amount of of determination in my soul that i'll just work with until my last breath so thanks for listening and thank you thank you and welcome back um carl stewart kevin I'm in, Carl. There you are. Good. Oh, man. <laughs> Quite a few acts here, to, tough acts to follow. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, it's, I've been going back and forth with, um, between uh, just so frustrated with having ideas for the past 15, 20 years that just can't get any traction on um it's just in the past few days in fact i had a long conversation with doug b yesterday and stuff but it's kind of um focusing on like on the on the core like some core events that are coming on we can't you can't predict the future but you can you can be thinking about what kind of presence I'm going to have at a conference in October, and especially if those are annual conferences or whatever. So that's kind of the approach I'm going to take. Um, got a lot of a lot of things going on. We just got a new um, our um, new um, chief data scientist just um, started at GSA July 31st, so, um, and um, we have a the section 508 which is the dis, um, people with disabilities that's um a big ass assessment everybody had to submit uh assessment um august 11th so looking at um at how that um it ties in one of the projects i'm doing at work is we have a we have a um team uh, mailbox. So I'm actually looking at having a, a Gmail front end to the brain kind of thing. So, and towards um, developing a um, kind of the proof of concept for getting into team brain um, and stuff at work. And I've had team brain um, for quite a while um, and stuff. So, work with Doug on some things and number of other people at school but um yeah i really see i think it's kind of finding those um the organizations that are trying to get back to um basics with um time and things there's a um a 90 91 rule that i had run across that said for the first 90 minute for 90 days the first 90 minutes should be focused on one major on you know one major goal um type of thing then with getting things done there's the two minute rule um i'm horrible at estimating time though but i'm uh i actually have started tagging items that i think should take two minutes or less and then there's the the um 
because a lot of times you do have to follow up and keep track of stuff anyway. And then there's the um, Pomodoro technique, which is, I don't know how much, it's basically 25 minute time blocking and stuff between those. Um, so just trying to kind of get back to basics on, on the time things and then, and uh, yeah, it's just trying to identify, I and mean, there's so many different um, lanes I went through. Um, I thought we were going to have to move back in January. So <laughs> this year has been crazy. We there were four four loads of stuff that people took to <laughs> landfills. I think it was somewhere between ten and eleven thousand pounds of <laughs> stuff, mostly old papers and stuff. I still have more to go through I, uh, the treasures and stuff I found uh, I found a CD which was the first um, 508 compliant version of Word Perfect back in 1999. Uh, <laughs> I found the DVDs that are the now defunct Federal Knowledge Management Working Group <laughs> and stuff. Um, yeah just all kind of, and then as you say go through stuff and I found like a bunch of old family photos stuck in a box with 1996 tax returns. <laughs> so you can't, you think you you can just go through boxes and throw them away, but it's, um, it's tough. So um, yeah, so I did buy the house. So at least I don't have to deal with, I've got uncertainty in where I'm gonna be living now. Just, um, so. I think basics, like I said, uh, kind of focusing on time and different ways to, and then the thinking in terms of the events that I'm involved in in the communities. Um, Doug Engelbart talks about networked improvement communities and stuff. So, I mean, I, you know, it's systematically improving the improvement processes and things. So, the, the groups that are really it, the ones that are really focusing on trying to improve things. Um, but yeah, it's it's scary with um, the way things are going. Um, yeah, the, I, I'll post the link. It's my, I've made it my um, Facebook cover, but Ray Anderson's work with Interface Carpet and he wrote, um, well, Engelbart um, inspired the uh, uh, par paradigm leaps or whatever, and um, Ray Anderson really is a, um, he, he leapt from conservation, which he framed as starting with Rachel Carson and Silent Spring to, um, to um, what he was saying, um, restorative and stuff. Sustainability is not enough. Sustainability is just about not doing no, more harm. No, do no more harm. That's not enough. We need to be trying to help the planet heal. We need to be um, trying to help the planet heal faster. I mean, that's kind of, I came up with Catalytic Leaps is the name of the company I want to um, try to get started. And as you said, there's <laughs> got to do, got to just do stuff. So um in that mode and so i guess um stewart's left still and so i'll stop there thanks carl um i haven't seen you in a while so we're happy to happy to see you um the queue is stewart kevin pete Uh, so, <clears throat> so much richness, richness um, that you've given me to play off <laughs> tickled my my mind in so many different different ways. <clears throat> I was just thinking that if I was checking in yesterday, um, I'd be in almost like a little cocaine rush, uh, in in the sense that it was a heavy day of steroids and drugs. <laughs> and 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 it was really interesting. It reminded me of um, watching the movie Bullworth, uh, 
last week, which is an extraordinary prescient movie um, that was made almost 40 years ago, something like that. Warren Beatty's last film, and I understand why he, I understand why he stopped. Um, and you know, that being said, um, I echo Gil's thoughts about the incredible value uh, that this conversation uh, provides for all of us. You know, we just may be <laughs> the mystics and prophets of our age in this conversation here. Who knows? I, you know, who knows? Who knows? But the thing that I appreciate most is that um, most everybody here is aware um, of what's going on, and yet we're neither maudlin or complaining. We just continue to put one foot in front of another, doing the work that we we are supposed to be doing, whatever that happens to be. But somehow we've all gotten to that place of you know what I come to call um, inner space. Um, you know, we've conquered the physical world. Class, you said it beautifully. This is, you know, previously collapses were were local, but this one, this one is global. Uh, there's no place to run and hide, no place else to go except for the folks who want to go colonize outer space. To wish I wish them, you know, the best of <laughs> the best of luck, or people building um, shelters or buying guns. Um, we don't know where it's going. Um, you know, all of our calm presence and the projects we're working on, um, no pun intended, may be totally trumped uh, by folks acting in a dystopian way in the antithesis of what it means to be a human being. Um, Doug, I had, I had a, I, Doug B, I had a thought about your, your check-in. It reminded me of two things. One, you know, the switch from an anthropomorphic view into a, uh, you know, as, a, as an individual into I'm not the center of this. And it brought me back to around 1990 when I was really having a rough time. And um, I found uh, a, someone that I worked with for a short period of time who happened to be the, the wife of um, Richard Bandler, uh, famous for... Um, uh, Bandler and Grinder, um, I forget what their what what their work uh, was. Neuro linguistic programming. programming NLP. Anyway, Bandler was a controversial character, but his wife had developed this body of work around um, consulting to people um, to ascertain what the driving question of their life was, and how that might be modified to make for a. <laughs> a quote, better life. And I was living the question of, I have to save the world. <laughs> I personally <laughs> have to save the world. <laughs> and she says, well, no wonder you're, you're, you're crazed. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just a, 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 a question that'll, you know, run you off the cliff. It's disastrous. And so we modified it to, to you know, be a person who helps and contributes to what it is that's 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 going on in the world, um, and and Ken, like you, I've been following climate since I first read Al Gore's first book. Uh, I don't remember exactly when it was published, but I read it in the in the in the late '80s as a, as an eye opening piece. Um, I, I helped him write it while he was still in the Senate, so. <laughs> Earth in the balance. Yep, that was it. Mm -hmm. That was it. Beautiful. Thank you, Mike. Um, in um, in ninety three, I published an article in the legal profession called "Silver Foxes and the Art of Resolution," and it articulated my ideal of what a great judge, lawyer, mediator would actually do in looking at all sides of any situation and applying some wisdom to it. And there's, there's. Um, by the way, it happened to be um, an article uh, that precipitated meeting my, meeting my, my, my wife, um, who I was with for about 23 years. And the first thing she said to me was, and this is around 93, you're not the silver fox. You're you're much too young to be the silver fox. 
<laughs> but now I kind of feel like I've grown into that identity a little bit. Um, you know, when 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 you were talking about purging, Mike, um, I immediately thought of the twenty five suits in my closets <laughs> from from a, from a bygone from a bygone era. And anytime it feels like the closets are too filled, I say, "Oh, I think I got to get rid of those. Those are those are, those are those are ridiculous." Along with these things called ties that you know. Every once in a while, you need one for a funeral or something like that. Um, but this notion of of, of silver foxes, um, I think it's what we're, we 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 aspire and want to be at this moment in time. <clears throat> you know, we all know what's going on, and no one's running around like Chicken Little um, with their heads cut off, um, which is a beautiful thing to to see and observe, I think. Um, Carl, you raised a great point when you start to talk about presence, um, which 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 puts me into um, you know the whole Meg, Le Meg Wheatley universe of um, who do you who do we choose to be at this moment in time? Are we going to be uh, our worst human or our best human? And that that to me is I'm realizing how. <clears throat> magical the work with Meg has been over the last seven or eight years. You know, uh, my primary meditation teacher was a guy named <clears throat> Jerry Grinelli, who was also a Grammy nominated, Grammy nominated um, jazz musician, a drummer. And it's a most amazing thing to study meditation with an ADD <laughs> individual drummer. Um, but, but, that whole universe forced me to really think about, <clears throat> oh, are we in a place of collapse? Because Meg came to that conclusion um, early on, early on. Um, and the second edition of her book even focuses it better than the, than, than, than the first one. But the idea of who do we choose to be? Um, and it's amazing how um, most everyone, if not everyone on this call, is choosing to be a certain kind of presence as we go forward. Um, but I went through, <clears throat> you know, um, terrible mindset. Wait a minute, maybe this is all falling apart. All the things that you hold in your whole life aspire to. Um, to get to, hmm, maybe all of those foundational pieces don't mean anything anymore because um, we have killed the goose that laid the golden egg. Um, and, and there's no stopping the emergent trajectory. Um, and, and yeah, so our, our mindsets turn to, so what after collapse? When is collapse? We don't know. You know, what a great opportunity to live in a place of not knowing. <laughs> <laughs> um all right i think that that's uh enough rambling um because it feels like a little bit of a ramble but i just i guess i want to say that um it's a privilege to be in this conversation with all of you and and so many of you are doing just such great work in the face of not knowing thank you mm -hmm. thank you Stuart. Um, at the beginning of this call, I thought we'd be done with <clears throat> check-ins real quick and then off into conversations, and we are not likely to make it through the queue, which as- Good morning, Alex. Welcome you to the Wire for America by 3046 Services to Pittsburgh. Well, I begin Kevin, is that happening on your computer? Yes, uh, but as luck would have it, Kevin, you are next in the queue. So if you can resolve the thing that just started playing and jump in, that would be great. Kevin, Pete, Julian. Okay. I, well, you know, if I weren't on a four-hour delay in O'Hare, I would have missed the call. So that's the, the upside of the morning, I guess you'd say. <clears throat> um, you know, the, going back a step, uh, you know, Ballad of a Thin Man, you know, and you go into a room and you know something's happening, but you don't know what it is. Mr. Jones came out when I was in seventh grade, when I had no idea what was going on. I was still wearing flannel lined jeans because they felt good, where everybody they came back in much later. On. Yeah, well, yeah, but I, everybody was doing white Levi's and I didn't understand 
that fashion had become a thing in seventh grade. So it was just one of those things. I, I'm up here in Chicago. Have, we're working with a college that is, we're getting really close to figuring out a model that can eliminate student debt, making the college a work college and with tuition grants and some other things like that. So it's pretty interesting. I'm also Are working the, 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 the two, okay, three, I think, three, now I understand the voice that was impinging on us. So, uh, Kevin, the, uh, uh, yeah, yes, so I'm, I'm we're we're meeting. Three, I think the decision in Montana is really great, and I'm meeting with. I, I put it in the link in the, the community environmental uh, legal defense uh, group, and uh, they're working on uh, personhood of rivers as and and of townships that can have rights over corporations. And they've got a network of about seven or eight places that are making real progress. And so we, we're going to see if we can get them engaged with, with our Swannanoa River. And they really do guide groups into meeting. Uh, and, and it gives folks a linear task that you can be at endlessly and incrementally. And everybody's uh, court opinions in Vermont help you in North Carolina. So I'm, it's a pretty interesting group like that. And, and there's, a, there's a real vital network uh, that they've set up. So that's, that's a pretty interesting thing. So, um, you know, I again take, as I look at the future, I don't really. Uh, I, I have a friend who's working with 90,000 refugees in a city in Thailand. And uh, he, he says, look, I don't look at the horizon. I look at the proximate. And, uh, you know, he looks at these refugees that he was able to place. And he doesn't look at the things he does. And if he looks at the horizon, he loses hope. If he looks at the next refugee he works with, he can do stuff. And I, I, I've always found, for me, the Serenity Prayer really works. I, I you know, work yeah. at the things I have powers to change, and I, I don't focus on the things I don't. And, uh, you know, despair is the common substrate for so much. Uh, and I, I just, you know, for some reason, I, I, I don't go there, and my mind doesn't go there. So... Anyway, the the uh, so that so that's that's my response to, to where we're going on stuff. Um, thanks, Kevin. You're reminding me that this week there were there was a big win and a big loss for the Commons. The loss was uh, the Internet Archive got uh, basically so lost, the, lost the lawsuit. Eight and nine. Pittsburgh five thirty eight forty six. Kevin, if you can mute. There we go. Good. Um, the Internet Archive lost a big lawsuit against book publishers and also got sued by uh, record labels for publishing uh, 78s that have gone completely out of print that nobody is actually making available. That's a really weird lawsuit, but the, the archive is in a lot of trouble. And the win was in Montana, where a judge found for the, 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 ch the kids who are basically suing because their futures are being impinged. And Montana happens to have a law that says it's not. Yeah, um pete you're next in the queue and uh it, it, let me finish on the montana lawsuit is really interesting because of the facts that were agreed upon and the way that they set up how climate could be used so anybody working on river personhood was greatly you know the, the facts that were stipulated and agreed to it's a really interesting precedent of, of how you can get this done. It's, it's more than just a case. It's, 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 the, it's the facts that were disputed and the climate deniers that were uh, shown to not be. So it's, it's, a, it's a really, uh, you know, it's a modular mobile precedent kind of thing. You can drop this, this part into anything that this network is doing. So, Love that. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for amplifying on that, Kevin. Uh, Pete, it is your turn. Uh, thanks, Jay, and thanks, everybody. I'm going to skip over uh, collapse and resilience, kind of, because um, I have a bunch of other stuff I want to talk about real quick. Um, uh, stuff going on in my life. Um, uh, my wife and I are still COVID conscious. Uh, COVID is still around, folks. Uh, use a mask. Get your indoor air cleaned. D don't don't stay in dirty indoor air. Um, wear a good mask, which means not a cloth one or a, even a surgical mask. You need it N95. Um, Plex came out uh, yesterday. I, it's a really good uh, issue. Check it out. Uh, lots of cool stuff. Um, there's a, a group that uh, we did our first uh, meeting today uh, working on Markdown and Git for collaborative writing, uh, which is 
very similar to Massive Wiki, but a little bit different, focused more on writing and uh, maybe getting uh, some fancier collaboration features uh, from Git and GitHub. Uh, we might have a, we'll probably have a, another meeting next Thursday at 7 a.m. Um, Massive Wiki, Bill Anderson and I are continuing to do cool stuff with Massive Wiki, um, uh, slow but steady. Um, it's getting better and better. Uh, I've got my past shift people start up with Matthew Lowry and uh, Wendy Elford, who are both actually OGMers, even though they're in strange parts of the world uh, where it's hard to get to this meeting. Um, uh, we teach people about AI uh, and other interesting technology stuff. So that's coming along well. Uh, Jordan is kind of back on the ground and doing stuff. Um, he, it's, he's recentered from Lionsburg to his personal brand kind of, and he's gonna be fundraising as, as Jordan Nicholas uh, for the next few months um, and making a go of it. Um, so he and I have been working together and so I'm helping get stuff. He's gonna have a podcast called um, above the chaos, which should be a lot of fun. Um, I'm still having a ton of fun with, and a and ton of fun and other stuff with ChatGPT and MidJourney now. Um, I was out of MidJourney for a while and, and, uh, and, and I've played with Staple Diffusion and Dolly. They're all wonderful. MidJourney 5 is pretty mind blowing and amazing. Um, and, uh, and it also, I've, I've done, I've, I think I've done literally thousands of MidJourney images. Um, one of the things it does is there's a whole bunch of very trite things that it does. And I think I, there's a, you kind of have to break through the, you know, the first, you know, um, images that it creates and get to um, more interesting ones. And I think I've done that. So more news on that at some point. Talking about you know, like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, collapse is coming or whatever, um, uh, resilience is coming or whatever. Um, it's a really interesting, I, I think of, you know, 50,000 years ago or something like that, you're a band of humans, you know, you're a few interlocking families, uh, there are 30 or 40 or 50 of you, uh, you've lived on this land for, you know, as long as you can remember, um, the, the elders tell stories of, you know, maybe a couple hundred years ago, you are on the edge. <laughs> Um, you can get wiped out pretty easily. You know, if, if a novel disease comes through, it's going to kill you all. Uh, if the matriarchs uh, get all, all trampled by elephants or buffalo or, or uh, you know, a few people, key people get taken out by saber-toothed tigers, you're in a world of hurt. Like your, you, your little civilization is going to collapse. So it's, it's really striking to me somehow. I, I, I always, when we talk about global civilization and humanity, you know, having problems. It's like, we've been through this before. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and I guess we'll get through it again. Um, uh, I tried real quick to do some research on population bottlenecks. Um, th there's a lot of research figuring out what happened when, where, but it's been the case through human history, deep time in human history, um, humans have gotten down to a few thousand individuals, like that's the whole population of humans and then have come back. Um, it's happened maybe a couple of times uh, in different places. Uh, so um, uh, not that we're guaranteed to have a, a population bottleneck and, and come back, but that's what happens. And last but not least, Ken, I, I'm cheered to hear your story of a uh, thousand CDs and getting them um, uh, digitized onto hard drives. I have a, a different story because I'm an early adopter. Um, I signed up for a service called Murphy back probably 20 years ago or something like that. Murphy, the name comes from Materials Recycling Facility, actually. Uh, and the, the promise was uh, you ship them, all your bulky CDs, um, and they put them in a warehouse and they digitize them and you can stream them whenever you want. Uh, this was before streaming was big. Um, and a, a cool thing I really liked also was um, you can trade your CDs with other people and since it's just moving a marker in the database, um, it's, there's no overhead, there's no shipping overhead, right? <clears throat> I have about a thousand CDs at Murphy. Um, some of them are like CDs that you can't find anywhere. You know, I have the one, <clears throat> one copy I've ever heard of. Um, I'm sure there were like a hundred copies, but you know, they're scattered to the wind. So Murphy, uh, the company went bankrupt uh, at some point a decade ago or something like that. And literally, um, they, they moved out, uh, landlord took over, and it's like, okay, well, I've got a warehouse I need to repurpose, and it's full of this crap. 
uh, boxes full of whatever. So they were really literally going to throw everything away, um, landfill everything, including my CDs. Um, luckily or unluckily, uh, there was an entrepreneur who had a, a failed streaming music business. Um, uh, and he's like, I could buy the, like the remaining assets. I could buy all those CDs and I could regenerate the, the whole Murphy service. And so he went on that path and he's like five or 10 years into it. Uh, this has been a Greek tragedy for this guy. Um, uh, he couldn't figure out how to pay in, enough money in Wisconsin where the, the warehouse was. So he found a place in Arkansas, moved everything there. Um, the, the warehouse there gets broken into. There's you know rats and holes and, and thieves and um, pe people with building licenses that um, have scanned them and things like that. Um, uh, he posts videos once in a while, you know, I'm still at it, guys. Um, keep the faith. And his idea is really to reconstitute the thing and have me paying again for, you know, 10 or 20 bucks a month, streaming the ability to stream my CDs. So um, I don't know what that story is. It's a, it's a fascinating story of, of cloud, tale. Um, and it's not a recommendation, huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not a recommendation yet. And I, I feel really bad for the guy. Um, I have this every once in a while, I have a dream of driving to Arkansas with a, a, a enough boxes to pack pick pick and pack all of my cds i don't know that that's ever going to happen um my wife has been very patient with all of our music and and including some like burn cds of canadian you know uh folklore and and um and christmas songs and things like that from her childhood you know it's like okay pete so shall we can we ever listen to those again and i'm like mm, so uh, a, a fun story. Ken, I wish I were you at this point, even though I, I'm not sure our, all the boxes of CDs would have made it through the serial moves that, that we've had anyway. So, and that's me. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Um, Ken, do you have a poem for us? I do. You know, I've been listening to this call and I, so many things is I, I've got like six poems open based on things that people have said, but I'm actually going to go with one that, that um, it's a little grim, but I like it. It's called The First on TV or Walter Cronkite. This is the 20th century. You are there, preparing to skin a human being alive. Your part will be to remain calm and to participate with the flayer in his work as you follow his hand. The slow, delicate way the knife between the skin and the flesh and see the red meat emerge. Tiny rivulets of blood will flow from the naked flesh over the hands of the flayer. Your eyes will waver and turn away, but turn back to witness the unprecedented, the incredible, for you are there, and your part will be to remain calm. You will smash the screen with your fist. You will try to reach the program on the phone like a madman, gripping it by the neck as if it were the neck of the flare, and you will scream into the receiver, get me station XYZ at once, at once, do you hear? But your part will be to remain calm. David Ignatow. Bam. And that's the way it is. And that's the way it is, except it's not, which is what he said after his last broadcast. Good to see you all. Thank you, everybody. Um, Good to see everyone. Take care. Thank you so much. Yeah, really appreciate it. Lovely call. See you next week when let's do some homework and get ready for conversation. Take Thanks care, all. everyone.